sort of set up sort of a panel, I guess a two-person panel. I guess it's official. Uh, first of all, my name is Adam Dunn from the Adam Dunn Show, THC, it's Hood Lamb. Uh, I've been involved in the hemp industry, which the hemp industry has changed a lot. When I started, hemp was considered clothing, maybe some, you know, some pressed oil, but like non-psychoactive oil. Um, nowadays, it's branched out into a, a thousand different directions. And when you say the word hemp, like in Colorado, you say the word hemp, you mean you mean high cannabinoid, low THC. Right. Nothing to do with manufacturing when it comes to uh, clothing. I, the, the, what, we, what we've been doing for, since 93 is um, textiles. Um, but like I said, the, the game has changed, and hemp is now a bigger, bigger umbrella to come under. And uh, we got two guys on stage. One, one uh, Anthony from Sab. How do you pronounce Sabia. Uh, Sabia. Sabia. Uh, Sabia. Sabia. And uh, O420 Inc. dot com. Gotta get that right. Exactly. It's tough when you start mixing up the 420s and start throwing zeros in there. <laughs> um, Anthony's a facilitator, I, could, I guess you could call it, right? He brings, he, he, he got an idea, we'll make it happen, right? It's one of those kinds of concerns. Try, try. I'll let him explain further. But and then we have also um, George Howard. Howard, yes. And uh, you're out of Knoxville, Tennessee, and uh, you're, a you're in the beverage industry for, for all long. types of nutritional products. Right, exactly. And now you're jumping into the CBD market. Yes, a lot of people demand it. Um, and you'll see the the thing about uh, trends, which is what we are in, right? Even though a lot of us have been doing this our whole lives, we've somehow managed to fall into this trendy section that we're in right now. But it's about capturing that moment. Uh, and if you're interested in doing that, you know, you got to be quick because these things they progress quickly, they change, and it gets really uninteresting quickly once you start figuring out, like, oh my God, do I have to do all that to do that? Like, I thought it was going to be simple. So. Uh, Good moment of time to strike while the iron's hot. Hopefully, these guys can. Uh, if you're interested in, this, in bringing some sort of hemp product to uh, the market, these guys can help you out. And I'm going to let them uh, do the intro. I'll give you guys both your. You have your own mics each. All right, everybody. Thanks for coming out, and uh, thanks, Adam, for the intro. Yeah. And uh, we, I'll go ahead and speak for pretty much every speaker here. Thanks for coming out and giving us a shot to chit chat with you. Uh, Real quick, there's a guy on the other side with the uh, that little breathalyzer that kind of tests your THC levels. I just did it. I got the highest levels apparently in the state. So you know, the, the, guy's needle, the, the needle didn't come back. So whatever, we send him back. But uh, we uh, look with, with what Adam was talking about with hemp. There's um, the last couple of years, it was really wide open, and not everybody was pressing at it. And then last year, everybody and their brother planted seeds and opened up a processing facility and did this and that. So it's a tricky area right now because there is a bunch of glut right now and um, farmers that were putting projections out last spring that were, we're going to get three dollars a point and this is going to be great are here in a, like on the low of like 30 cents a point which is absurd so it, it is tricky you know the planning part got tricky uh, with a, a lot of uh, and that's why George is so good to have in here because he's got a finished product and in my opinion that was the one big link that's been tricky for farmer and lab to connect um, if they're one dimensional you kind of have to deal with what the market is going to do to you you're really at the mercy of the wholesale market but if you do have a retail store or a retail product you can kind of work in a different plane as opposed you know you can actually get the, the final sale potentially if you have a store which is great some of the spots that um, I'm out of the TAC industry here in Denver so like the, 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 the spots I see doing the best are the ones that are all vertically integrated right they grow the flower they make the product they have a dispensary they sell it and uh, they're much more protected against the volatile market and that's what it is right now so it's not all uh, what's the word champagne and rainbows that's the phrase so it's not right now so maybe we can uh, help that so people are experiencing problems like that right now maybe we can talk through it throughout the uh, course of this uh, how many in here is my morning hey how, how many in here are farmers or uh, uh, okay uh, extractors processors uh, how many here are looking for like finished product? Okay. Lady. okay. So I was reading the, uh, the description of the talk this morning, and I called Anthony. I said, you know, Anthony, 
I don't know if I'm on the wrong top, right panel, man. So he's going to be the sun, and I'm going to be like the moonlight on this deal, okay? Because I stayed at the Comfort Inn uh, next door yesterday. Not the Holiday Inn. If I, if I stayed at the Holiday Inn Express yesterday, I'd be waxing poetically this morning. But yesterday what I was saying to some of the farmers is that, yes, we're in a winter right now because just overproduction. The bottom line is overproduction, right? So what do you do to differentiate yourself? It's like what he said. you got to swim upstream. you got to swim upstream. So you got to find yourself, in my opinion, a good co-packer. There's plenty in Colorado. There's plenty in Colorado. Uh, if you want to come to Knoxville, Tennessee, because you have a thing for Dollywood and a lot of fried foods or something like that, come on. We never get any snow, okay? We never get any snow over there. But um, so the things you need to look for, in my opinion, for a good co-packer, and there are tons and tons of co-packers coming up all the time. There are inexpensive ones out there, and then there are also some value ones, and then there's some more expensive ones. So the thing that I always say is that, you know, what position you want to get started in. So if you're just getting started and you got like extra biomass or you got some extra crude or some distillate, you're going, hey, I want to I want to get involved with the game right now. I want to do some uh, simple processing and get uh, tinctures or get some soft gels up. Or if you got if you got some high end powders, you can talk to me if you got high end powders okay, right away. But uh, then you would look at a co-packer as in smaller co-packers. They'll do smaller runs. They'll do smaller runs for you. And you can go check to make sure they got a GMP from like Colorado. The bigger ones that have um, uh, NSF CGMP certification that's out of Michigan or SGS out of Switzerland or UL ISO, some of these other things that you, you've seen on electronics and other type products, they're gonna look for bigger runs. Does that make sense? They're gonna look for bigger runs just because their operation is it takes a lot of time to set up and, and clean and also all the testing. So you got to you got to really choose a, what kind of scale you're looking for for your finished product. And then on top of that, what I'm also uh, recommending people do is that please don't come out just with the same old same old, all right, for yourself. Just a, a regular tincture, in my opinion, just on the milligrams, uh, or you just can't. You just can't, right? I was um. Uh, in Atlanta, just speaking at an expo last weekend. In Atlanta, the Chinatown is called Buford, Buford Highway. Well, where's the Chinatown in, in, in Denver? Is there a, like one section? I think it's off Havana in Aurora, and then it's off Federal in. Uh... Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So, what I'm saying, Buford Highway, which I know a little better in Atlanta. You can't have a Chinese restaurant there if you're not good, because they're gonna kick your ass out. Does that make sense? You're not gonna be able to stay, right? Same thing I'm talking about, I'm sure the areas he's talking about, it's gotta be pretty good. So, if you're brand new, you know the industry like the back of your hand, like he knows, or about the processing and the distilling and also the growing. And you're coming into the retail arena, you definitely need to look at something different. In my opinion, is this you gotta, you gotta find something that's true to your nature. Does that make sense? As in, if you, if you got a, you got a, you got a mom or a grandma that's got sleeping problems or she's got joint problems or she's got other type of like issues, in my opinion, you should be function specific. You try to find something within that function because then you're not just gonna get into a milligram war and you're gonna fight Charlotte's Web. Does that make sense? You're gonna fight Bluebird, you're gonna fight so many big brands you already have in Colorado. And you come out with something that's within your heart and the formulator guy that you find should be able to help you with that. Put some other herbals inside that's gonna work for you and then when you are talking to a customer and you can look big on the internet. Does that make sense? You can look as big as Charlotte's Web on the internet. Just find a good you know, local designer. I'm sure he knows tons of local designers. To make you look big and then you can compete because you can compete with a story that's true to you. And, and I'm telling you, because I make so much products for other type of people, all consumers are looking for a connection point. Does that make sense? Nobody wants us to be another cog in the wheel, right? They want to have some type of affinity for your product because that's how you're going to build your tribe. That's how you're going to build your tribe. So those are the things that I, I recommend you do as you go vertically integrate up. You try to find something a little more specific that's true to your, um, true to your heart, that you have a story for, and then you can start getting you know, Instagram or buying traffic, you know, Google allows you to buy traffic now, and you can get influencers that are specific for that, then you can get a beachhead, you don't have to compete with Charlotte's Web or, or um, you know, uh, CD Sciences, who's got a, a ton of money still to fight. Yeah, you know, um, to kind of piggyback on that, um, 
when you so the final sale is always just such a, a big deal. So if you can grow really good stuff, it's all, it's all gonna start with how well this stuff has grown. By the way, just to show a hand, how many people grew smokable hemp this year? Smokable. Now here's the question: is it smokable or is it jokeable? Okay, because I wanted to, I'm out of the THC industry where I had to run around Denver for, well, Colorado in general, but Denver and, and put flour on the shelves, and it's really picky, right? Like the you can't just have the schnickel fritz and walk into a store, you'd get laughed right out of it. So um, that was one of the things that I saw was probably the one thing I helped farmers with the most this last year coming through was they wanted to grow smokable because it had the highest resale value per pound, right? You, you're, you're figuring like we were projecting stuff on the low end, we should be able to get like 200 a pound, 300 for bulk, right? Bulk, and then it obviously if it, if it gets uh, you know, broke down into eights or smaller increments or whatever, like grams, the, the, the numbers would go way up, right? You'd think that, but then when everybody did it, and their mom also just compete. Now she's got her little spot out in the garage doing her smokable brand. All of a sudden, everything goes down, and you, you now have nobody really knows the difference anymore between an outdoor grown pound or someone that took hemp and put it indoor and grew a really good job because they're just saying I can get it for hundred dollars a pound or less right there because they, so uh, you really would need to work on a good quality and if you got really good quality you shouldn't have a problem selling it that's really like the number one thing I guess I could probably go back to and that goes with the the processors as well because uh, not, not everybody um, that does a co2 extraction does it the same way as the next one so um, the, the quality thing being able, and, and again where George was talking about um, a, a finished product I, yeah the, the, the thing is this you don't need to sell everybody you can't sell everybody it's impossible you can't sell everybody there's people I can sell that George can't sell there's people George can sell I can't even get a, a conversation with and you don't need that you only need to get some good relationships with a handful of locations and if they're killing it you know and you have a really good relationship with them you're gonna wind up keeping the product on the shelf and by the way anybody can put a product on the shelf but keeping it on the shelf is completely different so you know that takes a lot of being able to communicate and you know like again everybody wants to go try to sell everybody I was the same way too you know I put like a product on like 90 shelves in the THC world out here almost but over the last year I only dropped off stuff at like 10 spots because I just wound up working with bigger spots and I had better relationships and I didn't have to drive way the hell over you know the mountain and stuff and go here and there so working with quality and starting small and you can be a small time farmer and um Again, the small scale stuff is tricky because most processors have a certain number that they need to put in their machine to make it worthwhile to bring everybody in and hire them for the day and pay them. So um, if you are a small time farmer, try to figure out a way to get yourself into some sort of a group with a, yeah, come on in buddy, no standing outside, I got you. Um, you know, a, a small time farmer can still link up with a lot of other farmers and pull your stuff together. And I've seen a lot of like the farmers in the Amish community in Pennsylvania and it's kind of like what they did, you know, so two acres, three acres, five acres, but when 50 of you just grew, now you have a bunch and you can kind of work that angle. Um, by the way, if anybody just has a, we, we can only say so much here on Interrupted, so if you've got a question, just throw your hand up or whatever, scratch your face or something, we'll look for that uh, and, and, and see if we can pick up on it, but if you do have some questions, we'd obviously like to address them and see if we can help you get some stuff sorted out. There, my man. So I like your point about the different and unique. Do you see any holes in the market right now where there's products that are needed to defend? So. I, I, there, there are holes in, I mean, every, I mean, this, this, it's wide open, right? So what I said yesterday is that, you know, there's a big show coming on uh, in Anaheim um, in March, uh, Expo West. It's the biggest um, business to consumer, also business to business show, but it's all the nutritional stuff, all the healthy foods, uh, smart food, and literally over 100,000 people will go. Now, if you can't make it out there, what you can do is just, just look at Expo West, you can also look at Supply Side West, you can look at nutrition and ingredients, and you start picking out the winners last year. Does that make sense? The hot winners last year, right? Top five, top 10. Look at it the last couple of years, because majority of the brands over there, they still don't have the cojones like you guys have to step in to see even CBD. Does that make sense? So what you can do is you can emulate them and then make it yours, make it your story. And as he said, as he said, I think it's critical is that we had another person uh, yesterday, he's going, you know, how do I compete against Walgreens? And I'm going, you're not going to be able to if you ask that question. 
All right? You're not going to be able to, right? Um, you got people who are well-funded, already have uh, sales, they already have a war chest. They're going to go after the big um, um, box of players, uh, especially after, hopefully, the House resolution bill that was uh, put uh, forth in ag from the Agriculture Department to get ingestibles um, green-lighted. When that happens, I'm telling you, Costco's come in, uh, Walmart's coming, CVS, Walgreens, everybody's coming. Everybody's coming. And and they're going to come in a way that they're going to they're going to they're going to really depress the prices. That's my opinion. That's my opinion. So they're going to go after the broad market. That's why I think it's also important that you iterate right now and you be different. You take a niche product, but a niche product could make you millions of dollars. A year. Does that make sense? In your pocket. All right. But Costco and Walgreens and uh, they're not interested in that. They're just looking for a mass market. It's going to do a hundred million dollars or something like that. You got to play. You got to play differently. And as he said, you got to concentrate differently. Don't think about just the mass um, uh, big box stores. Think about independent pharmacies. Think about like uh, salons or uh, boutiques. Think about those areas. And, and they're looking, they want to sell CBD, but they don't want to sell CBD at Walmart selling or Walgreens selling. That, that hurts them. They want to sell higher quality. And as you get your uh, product up on the website and it looks really, really good, that's going to help you sell your biomass. That's going to help you sell your distillate. That's going to help you sell your crude because you're going to find other people going, oh, you know, your stuff must be really high end. So I want to be able to buy your stuff. You know, uh, the one thing I would say, the one market that is not being touched really at all in the United States is the true industrial side, right? So 99, probably more than that, of the plants that have been grown over the last bunch of years, they're uh, a hybrid hemp plant, right? It's not the traditional long sativa plant that was grown for multi-purpose where you had the stalk and the, you know, the herd you had fiber out of it and stuff and then there was also flower. So there, it's an indica plant, it's a big wide plant, you can't fit nearly as many on an, an acre. And um, everybody that grew for hemp was growing for high CBD yields because that's where the money was. Uh, I truthfully believe that the big untapped area is like the industrial side. It, it, it's, uh, I, I said, give me what the, uh, go ahead, whatever, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, just to answer that question of the whole market, we're a USDA certified organic extractor of all kinds of products. So we do have now, but we already were USDA certified organic. So we found the highest end, our previous biggest customer is Gucci. So for the supplements market, so whether we're doing rosemary or lavender, with Fuji or a big bulky company like that, that they say, well, we can, how can we notch it up a step? To your point, how do I notch it up a step? So, certain USDA certified organic, not just some generic organic, right? Like, no, I'm, I'm glad you just said that because um, I've been dealing with the, this market for the last bunch of months here with the prices going way low and the only true protection that I've seen for a farmer or a lab is that it's certified USDA. It's organic, certified USDA organic. That biomass has a much higher resale value on it and uh, they can't really just drive you into the ground because there's so little of it. So, um, so stored somewhere that's not, but people also make that mistake. Like, well, I grew it organic and then they gave it someone to store or they put it somewhere? Sure, and they put it at like some garage down the street, right? Then you're done. We, we as an extractor cannot process organic if you didn't bring it from somewhere or, or, or with a truck or a service that was also certified. Every step of the way, we're very serious about that. Yeah, good point. Yeah, grow as much organic. Yeah, go ahead, David. On the uh, industrial side, have you seen like the processing? You know, like right now, processors like who's making hemp green food. So, so, and yeah, again, like the, the, what's the wide open thing? Is there are not, so we're like 99% of the processors are just buying gigantic, huge equipment to just squish oil basically out of what you send into them. There's very few that have invested in a decorticator or something along those lines that can go ahead and, you know, kind of facilitate that side. Uh, I get, it's just wide open. I mean, you could literally take hemp green, mold it, turn it into houses, sell it, and you know, you know someone who doesn't, you know, there's no nails in it, and yeah, you know, we put solar panels all over the place. And that's, I mean, you'll sell that for a bunch of money. It's not getting done right now, it's getting done a little bit. But like, if you're asking like, what's the, I mean, it's literally like 99% to one, just they're not being grown. by And just the reason why is because a lot of the farmers are afraid of cross-pollination. So they don't want to have, a, you know, their neighbor grow 90 million industrial hemp. Go ahead, really. So you're kind of tying those two together, 
you still have all the fiber in the spot. Like, what are those guys doing? So you do have it, but it's a different kind of setup. So where it's not the long sativa plant that has the long, uninterrupted stalk, sure. it's the hybrid sativa, uh, excuse me, indica plant, which is a little fat, bushy one. So you can't really pull it for fiber. You can still get it. There is fiber out of it, but you can, yes, you can, you can, you can wood chip it. You can pulverize it like that. But uh, and you can even turn that stuff into like animal bedding. Like goats will eat goats will eat anything. You could feed a goat a beach towel. They'll eat a beach towel. Right? But you know you. With, with, with that stuff, you can take. That's my experience. Yeah, it was summer camp back in the day. Um, so, capture the flag. Yeah, you're not going to beat this. Okay, we just fed it to the goat. <laughs> So with, um, <laughs> with <laughs> so with like you can you I've, I've seen farmers mix like a really chopped up version of the stock and stem mix it with molasses you can turn it into like an animal feed there's all kinds of different stuff you can do with it but I still think hempcrete because it ties directly into the real estate market would probably have the highest upside if you could really. Uh, you're better off if you can do this all by yourself and not have to talk to five different other people along the way because your margins get much shorter. So if you're just making hempcrete and selling bricks, you'll make this much. But if you can find a GC and then buy the property and build it up, you'll make that much. So it's it's usually better to try to keep as many hands off it as possible. Are the, are the CBD, the big CBD producers, doing anything with the rest of that biomass? Are, are you talking about like the leftover stalks and stems? Yeah. I mean, everybody's, it's out there. I mean, there's definitely people buying it. They, yeah. they, they buy it, you know, really low prices, but they, you know, they, it is, there is a market for it. And even paper companies, you know what I mean? Like a paper companies can decorticate it and turn it into a really fine shredded. That's what they have to do. They have to turn it into that before they can do it in the paper. Yeah. Yeah, I can kind of piggyback on what you were just saying about cross pollination sure. and the reason why that market hasn't really stabilized yet. I think a lot of it is because conventional financing options haven't been available to build those facilities up until now. So hopefully we'll see more use of the plant and spy products to come. Um, yeah, and, and to go on that point too, as far as uh, you know, getting cannabinoid products on major on the shelves of major big box retailers. What do you think are the challenges, George, um, from a regulatory perspective and from a supply chain perspective of those major brands? Well, I, I went to the ECRM. That's like speed dating for uh, big box stores. Okay, so um, right now they're only going to touch mostly topicals. All right, if they're going to touch anything at all, and uh, um, of course, you know the biggest one is Amazon. They're not going to touch anything except uh, phytorich cannabinoid oils. That's it. Um, but. Um, they're looking for clarity for regulation and before they do ingestibles. And you, you also see uh, bigger companies that already have ingestibles right now that uh, um, and topicals and uh, they have it on the shelves and now they're putting more of their effort into just the topical section, especially with uh, the two class action lawsuits that were filed in uh, December. I mean, glad that there's, the federal judge put it on stay at this time. So those are the challenges. If you're a smaller guy, I'm going to tell you the the mass, the big box stores, they're going to want you to deal with a co-packer that has. Uh, NSF or um, UL or uh, ISO. If it's a food product, they're going to want um, a BRC or SQF. Those are minimums. And then you're going to have to make sure you have probably like five million in liability insurance. Uh, and then you're going to get really into testing. You're going to get into testing, in my opinion, even beyond your co-packer. Just to double check. All right, double check. As in, you know, when I'm buying isolate. What? Well, let's say when I'm buying like other herbal products, like medicinal mushrooms or a curcumin or whatever have you, okay, stuff you see at GNC. I buy... You I got the hook up on mushrooms? <laughs> <laughs> we are in Denver, I don't Dude, know. I'm going to be on video, man. People want to hunt my down. I, I'm going to be lynched by, not the KKK, the mushroom KKK, around right, right, my ass in Tennessee. Uh, I got some mushrooms, okay, but let's not talk about it. All right, so, um, um, so what I was saying, you all got me off flush. All right, so what, I, what I'm saying right now is this, that... Um, when I'm buying other type of herbal products that you see at GNC, I bring it in, and let's say I bring in like uh, 50 barrels, 25 kilos, right? Well, 50 barrels, all I do is I do square root N plus one, and I test that. That's it, that's all I have to do. Because I know the people I'm buying from, they're 
they're worth like two hundred million dollars or a hundred a million dollars. I mean, hundred million dollars, or they're a five billion dollar French company or something like that. They stand behind the product. They're NSS certified. The whole value chain is already very, very mature. Does that make sense? And and once in a while, I'll have to still reject stuff, as in this doesn't make my uh, spec. It doesn't meet my spec. But when I get into the CBD type, holy shit, man! It's like people lying to me left and right. So even if they're a big company. I'm still testing a lot of times each kilo, especially if it's bag in a kilo. And then on the invoices, I recommend for especially on the invoices or on your contract if you're dealing with somebody, that you make sure that you can reject the items. Because you know, once they have your money and the stuff, like isolates, not 99.9% .9 or something like that, and come down 95%, I gotta get more stuff. Does that make sense? I can't make that 95%, 99%, right? So um, those are the challenges in the code packing side and you only have pretty much one chance like he said he got his stuff in like 60 70 stores those guys they may not buy uh, consistently but he still has a good relationship with them on the big box you burn your chance and your stuff didn't go through that buyers not come back to you so you really got to prepare yourself and in my opinion build small and build tribally that you got a good brand so when you do have a uh, chance to shine in a big box location it's going to have throughput. It's going to have good throughput. By the way, most big box locations only onboard like four times a year. Like it's like a quarterly thing that they do. So you really do have to have your your pitch down pretty well. And because you're going to get one shot with them, they're going to bring on some stuff during that quarter. And then they just won't talk to you anymore. So, uh, but again, like those will take longer to, to, to go down. But if you do hit when they're big, but again, another uncapped area, I, it's, it's definitely the retail selling of it. So again, just kind of, I, I, you know, I, I know a lot of people from out around uh, Colorado and stuff, but there's people from outside here, okay? So everything I pretty much draw on is my experience out of the THC industry. So there's already a built up market. Everybody here can go to a store and get it, but there aren't as much direct hemp selling, CBD selling type of stores. That's why you see the little memes like, oh, this shit didn't work. Oh, you bought it at a gas station. Like, so, because they're buying, you know, you're buying it at, at a place that's like, doesn't specialize in it. So you can't, um, you know, there may be a home delivery service or something eventually for for weed or whatever THC products. We get specific, okay? But um, nothing's gonna be going into the store and actually communicating back and forth with the person because they have a, a different education level. And they, even if you know a product really, really well, you might want to try something else. And you know, some bud tenders tried it. So again, being able to actually have a store where people can buy hemp products, I think, is invaluable. I really do. With, with, with a really good education and a really well-trained staff like you can retain customers over a long period of time I, I truthfully believe that's the number one thing that I mean even if you just started small and you took like if you grew smokable hemp flour okay so you got a little bit of smokable and then maybe you took another portion of what you had and you processed it into an oil I mean even if you just set up like a drive-through and sold two products directly to the you know the customer to the, to the public you do way better than trying to beat your head trying to sell it wholesale everywhere else I just know it. I see how it happens because you get a much bigger markup on it. Yeah. So, I mean, when you sell on like big box stores, you also got to think margins going to go down to and you're also going to have their in what terms, right? 15 to, do you have the capital and the cash flow to get you through to the other side of that? So, without a good base business of stuff that's coming in and coming in, big box stores, maybe outside of your wheelhouse. You know, in four months, you got a business from it. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I think also, you're a very beautiful lady. So I'm going to tell you this, okay? Big box stores, you got to date them for a long time. They're not just going to, you got you to be all the events, you got you to gotta know them and everything else like that uh, for a while. And they understand that the buyer, they got a job. When they put something in the store, that thing has to sell. If they get a whole bunch of stuff that didn't sell, they're out of a job, right? So so you got you to gotta build some traction right off the top. And, and then I'm, I'm, from, I'm, I'm from Tennessee. We don't even have medical right now. So what you have is you have just tons Tons of stores getting started just selling CBD, so you can go after those stores. I, I, I gotta believe, I gotta believe there at least that's gotta be at least probably like four or five thousand uh, CBD only stores across the United States right now, and most of them are independent. Most of them are independent, so you can contact those people. And then going back to what you're saying is this: definitely 
if you if you got organic stuff that give you um, some uh, uh, price protection just make sure as he said the whole value chain of processing they have the organic certification uh, locations and you can also check like on USDA organic uh, uh, integrity uh, database on the players that are certified Exactly. Uh, so, uh, any, come on, we got some other questions. Got to be something. Who's over? So, smokable hemp. Who's having a hard time with their smokable? Who wants to get the smokable market broke down real quick? Someone, put your hand up. Fine. So, what what what, what, what kind of went down is, is this is uh, just you know uh, just let me just say this. There's big varying differences in qualities on what you could consider smokable versus jokeable. Okay, I'll go back to that again. There's a lot of people that grew basically biomass right and because it lights on fire